allow me to then um, invite um, our keynote speaker for this afternoon, who is uh, Professor Ola Uduku, who is um, easily one of um, Africa's uh, prominent um, architects. And um, he has worked at a number of uh, um, universities um, in Nigeria and also um, in the um, United um, Kingdom. And um, at the moment, she uh, heads uh, the uh, School of Architecture in, um, in Manchester. But um, she is always uh, moving on to, uh, on to greater uh, things. Uh, without uh, further ado, um, Professor Oduku, the floor is yours and welcome. Thank you very much. I'm going to share screen and I promise to spotlight myself afterwards, but there are some pictures to be seen first. So bear with me as they say. Right, let's share this screen. Okay, sure. And I'm going to go into presenter view. Here we are. Right. Am I in presenter view? No. Just a minute. I think I need to change this around a bit. Uh, presenter view. Stop share. Try it again. Let's go in again. Um, let's see if I can swap this round. That work. No. Just a second. I Right. Can you see this now? No, it's still. Uh, yes. I, is this in presenter view, though, or is it just the slides? I think presenter view is now bigger than the last time. <laughs> OK. Can you see the slides, though, as well? Doesn't really matter, actually. Yes, we can see African architecture conceptualizing modern East. Yes. OK, well, I think we'll have to take it that way. I'm sorry about this. I've been uh, doing other things at the moment. I should first of all say thank you very much to the organizers of the Modernist Her Heritage in Africa group. I think particularly Edward Dennison, but also Shahid and indeed Shadrach. Um, I feel I've been a kind of part-time participant in a lot of the discussions related to this really important forum, but it is really gratifying to see so many people at the conference and indeed the interest in the different sessions, which I was able to turn up to about midway through the, the morning. I think it's certainly touched a nerve, a good nerve and has got the debates going. So as I, as I, have, as I had said to Edward, what I was going to do was to just, um, if you like, produce my reflections. I hadn't quite realized it was a full keynote, but um, bear with me again and um, let's see how it goes. Um, I should also say that um, I remain a signed up member of Docomomo, so that's where my interests lie. Um, and also, I am speaking in my own capacity. Um, I'm actually about to leave to become head of school at the University of Liverpool, but I am speaking in my capacity as a research professor in architecture at Manchester School of Architecture. So with that, uh, that gives, give you, gives you the background. I should also say that um, my education, because I think my views are very much informed my, by my own education. I'm a graduate of the University of Nigeria, 
um, the architecture school at Enugu campus, and I have gone on to do a master's and a PhD in Cambridge. And I think I would say I am interdisciplinary in nature because I'm interested both in modernist heritage in Africa, particularly West Africa, education, and also the issue um, issues around urbanizing the um, infrastructure for those living in urban areas in both the so-called south and also in the west so with this as a background um, i hope you'll enjoy my reflections so um, i think the key thing today was to sort of i guess put the lecture into three um, areas really one is to do with i guess the background to what is modernism and heritage and indeed what's african heritage the second was to look at some of the buildings um, or rather to use some buildings to discuss these and then to go on to determine what i think the issues are and hopefully more and and encourage a debate than come to any particular conclusion. So if you're expecting a cut and dried lecture, I'm afraid that's not going to happen, but it's been a long day anyway. So hopefully you'll enjoy the discussion. So um, starting off, that's me with a colleague in Ghana, and this is indeed a modernist building, I guess, in the typical Western form of the, the word modern. It's um, the engineering block in at the KNUST, Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, designed by um, James Cubitt uh, and Kenneth Scott, who are both actually Australians or of Australian extraction originally, but um, worked as the British architecture firm James Cubitt and Scott, Scott and Partners back in the 1950s. And this was one of the, well, it's one of the most photographed buildings, at least in the 1950s, of uh, a higher education institution in West Africa at the time. But going on then, so I've sort of said, well, what might be modern and how do we see modern, particularly when we consider Africa? Now, let's see if I can get this to move. It's not moving. Let's see, will it do it? That's it. Right. All right, that's useful. Good. So we have again what we would call the traditional and vernacular. So I'm not going to teach uh, old women to suck eggs. Um, again, my images are really from my West African background. So we've got the Katsina walls above, and that's the um, the um, home of the Wana of northern Ghana. So the idea about what is vernacular seems to be very clear. Um, supposedly and this is traditional and this is african and if you like anthropologically and archaeologically probably this is what we would call african architecture but that in itself i think can be challenged what you have to the right indeed is the new york pavilion uh, the world fair by costa nimea what you can see in front is the idea about the breeze wall look at the date 1939 this actually predates a lot of the so-called tropical international modern. And interestingly, the history of the Breeze Wall, so to speak, particularly in Brazil, uh, suggests that it may well have come over from West Africa with the uh, importation of indentured labor, i.e. slaves from parts of Northern West Africa who had already, um, who were already conversant in the use of the uh, Mashribia. So it's a Muslim screen to screen at, screen away normally the harem well, where the women are from the main part of the house and they come to brazil and they call it coboga and this is actually it's a, it's a contentious bit of architectural technology at the moment because obviously le corbusier just happens to visit brazil at a certain point in the 1950s so there's that issue about Africa's already influencing other areas. We could go even further back, of course, and think about, um, we know the um, on the um, East African coastline, the, the, the um, relationship between Africa and the, the East, both um, India, Asia, and indeed China. And of course, on the, on the uh, converse, side, converse side in Lagos, we have the Shitabe Mosque, commissioned by um, a, a British um, governor, uh, designed for Muslims, but it was actually constructed by um, well, most of the, the um, most of the architects or the builders involved were actually returnees from the New World. So both the both um, the Americas and um, America and um, Brazil and so on. So the, the style is very Brazilian. In fact, they call it the Brazilian mosque. So we have this relationship between the two. So, you know, the idea that African architecture is uh, a thing and isn't already in itself 
fluid is something that I think we we have to begin to, to challenge. So the authenticity, if you like, of African architecture, I think is something that is possibly more a notion that we want to, to, to work with as opposed to what is the reality in terms of what we might call uh, traditional and indeed even modern architecture. And just to throw a further set of contention in, this is this is hot off the press, really. I was at a conference about the Alojo Bar, which is a building which most Nigerians will know, which was on camp campus square and was taken down five years ago by the family who owned it, the Olaya family. Now, the current records seem to suggest that it isn't actually of Brazilian extraction at all. It was a Spanish trader, trader who came to Nigeria for only five years and commissioned this building. It is in Brazilian style, but it was never owned by any of the Brazilian, Brazilian returnee um, elites because there had been a story about, and this is where the oral histories come in, about it being an area where there had been slaves kept. There's a basement where there were uh, supposedly chains, but now that a lot of the more up to date, well, the current research has taken place. The the land and the title to this, the title documents and the archive shows very clearly that this was not as old as it was su supposed to be, which is about the 1860s. It's more a building of the 19 between the 1910s and 1920s, and was originally owned by a Spanish person who then sold it on to somebody of Portuguese extraction. So, this issue about again, what's traditional, what are the histories, and what are the oral histories, is something that remains very contentious, particularly in, I guess, in African architecture, where I guess the technology that we now have, both in terms of being able to, well, the archive has always been there, but some of the other technologies around carbon dating and so on are things that we have to, I would say, engage with in more, um, more rigorously. But the idea about, again, what is, what the story is, what the narrative is, is something that we should always think about challenging. And so if we go into what we do consider modern, I think that's fair enough. Back to um, Kumasi, the building to the left. Although interestingly, this is um, Unity Hall, which again originally came down as part of the campus design and a lot of it was designed by Western architects. Now we find with the work of people like um, Lukasz Stanek that indeed Western architects would also include East European architects who are not necessarily um, recognized as being part of the builders. And in this case, also of the first, Niger um, one of the first Ghanaian architects, um, John Owusu Addo, who um, I could actually name check as being one of my lecturers at Enugu campus, who was part of the, who was part of the design team who designed this, um, so the tall building to the left. But um, I guess the more modern, the more I did, the, the notion of modern and modernity as we might see it again in the classical Western meaning would be the Tema, top, top right, Tema uh, market building and its use of uh, materials. And indeed, Fry Andrews, um, Amez de Fe, um, school which is in the northeastern region of of um, Ghana so these these buildings do exist and I guess their their um what I say their genesis or their we their provenance is well known but there again when we look through the records as in the case of Unity Hall it's slightly more nuanced there, there's more to it than just this was a set of buildings designed as part of the campus design by um by Cubitt and Scott, there's much more involvement by others, both in this case, both European and Eastern, in this case, Eastern European, and also in this case, indigenous as well. So going on, um, I thought, well, what do we now call contemporary? And interestingly, and I swear this was not put, this was put together yesterday and not today. Uh, surprise, surprise, the idea about the um, mausoleum, which we've just, which we've just talked about. I mean, I think, it, again, in chronological timescale, a lot of these are actually postmodern. Uh, we know for sure that um, Nkrumah died uh, in exile, and he only was reinterred reburied in the mausoleum in the 1980s because uh, myself and Irene have done some of some research on the dates and times uh, more more recent ones you've got um, uh, Heroes Acre in Zimbabwe that seems to be a theme that goes down a lot of um, southern Africa as well uh, and then of course we have the um, genocide memorial in Kigali. And I guess the issue here is that we're now looking at what is, if what I might call contemporary postmodern heritage that is being, I guess it's, we're, we're looking into, we're, we're looking at the, I guess, in some ways, the invention of tradition, um, because the idea about the mausoleum from what can be seen is not something in most cultures, certainly not in cultures south of 
the Sahara and south of, the, if you like, the Islamic north of West Africa would be normal to have a shrine towards anybody. Uh, so the idea about having, if you like, a shrine or a mausoleum is quite recent and quite postmodern. But also in the, these cases, oftentimes it is the gift of others to the country. So I think both in the case of Heroes Acre and the um, mausoleum in Ghana, these are gifts from uh, Eastern Bloc countries. Uh, in the case of Kigali, I haven't fully followed the provenance as to who designed it and so on, but they are they are modernist insertions. So what do we do with these? So again, just as we've just been talking about before I started my talk, I think we do need to extend the idea about what's modern and what we're preserving to what's happening now in the contemporary and the present day. And just again, taking us right up to speed, we know already that what's now being called the Afrofuturism movement is moving in at fast sp speed as well. I have certainly been to Echo Atlantic two years ago before the um, COVID epidemic. That's certainly being built at the moment. So Echo Atlantic is reclaimed land off the coast of Lagos, which is likely to be the largest gated community or gated island, indeed, is kind of post-apartheid apartheid, because you, you would need to get, you, you, not everybody's going to be able to get onto that island, but it is being built as we speak, and above is Le Fleuve, which is happening already, well, is being planned for um, the Democratic Republic of Congo as uh, an outshoot um, again, exclusive city uh, from uh, upriver from Kinshasa. And of course, there's been a lot about the Bitcoin uh, development of the, um, I can't remember its name now, but I have commented on it, um, the, the development of an Afrofuturistic town in, um, in, um, in um, uh, it's not Ivory Coast, so it'll be um, uh, Dakar. Uh, again, a Bitcoin millionaire has decided that this is what he's going to design. Um, interestingly, architecturally, in the case of the, um, the West African equivalent, not Echo Atlantic, this is a consortium that are based in the Middle East. So again, we have this if infusion of an Afrofuturist idea from the Middle East uh, to an African country. But in these cases, again, I think I would say that these are more to do with just what the contemporary is doing than necessarily what I might call architectural heritage, but um, they are being built. So again, what do we do with these as forms of uh, postmodern heritage? So let's think again about what we do think about when we think about heritage. So again, I mean, back to the, I guess, the social anthropological, some of it is difficult, some of it is forgotten. So uh, we do know about Fort Jesus. We know about all the history along the East African coast, which I've talked about. And to a less, I think to a more truthful extent, the West African coast and its uh, range of forts and, and fortifications and its relationship to the trans um, Africa, trans um, West, the transatlantic slave trade are very well known, but how many people have really looked at the um, the the histories or what's been left of the um, the concentration camps in which um, a lot of the Mau Mau resistance were interred to? Uh, so these are bits of heritage or culture that again are difficult or become forgotten, uh, unless I would I would posit, and again I have I know I have it well with I'm talking from I'm talking to Cape Town. So if you like the apartheid system has been well documented, but there are other, I would say, histories that are much more hidden and that often have less of, if you like, the airtime to the, what I call the tourist circuit. So um, certainly um, even as a, an, an African who did her entire secondary education in Africa, information about some of these, I feel like the darker parts of history and, and indeed the monuments that they left or did not leave are things that we would probably want to engage with. At the moment, some of you will know that in Namibia, there's a discussion about the settlement uh, with about the genocide of the Herero and how that's going to be, well, indeed what the restitution was going to be and what um, museums and monuments would come out of that. In the same way, um, I think we have this interesting relationship with Christianity. So there's any number of um, mission houses, in this case, I've gone to southeastern Nigeria, Mary Slessor, a kind of mini saint in Scotland, because um, uh, she she quite rightly got rid of the um, the killing of twins, 
So she's known as sort of saving the twins and you can see her original mission house in southeastern Nigeria in Itu. But below that you've got Ajay Crowther with um, former, um, well, they'd call them, um, what do you call them, um, worshippers of, um, of other religions. But this history again about these religious um, these other religions is much less covered. There has been some information, particularly to do with um, Susan ben Wenger in southwestern Nigeria and her work in shrines and the Orishas, but in parts of southeastern Nigeria and elsewhere, the history of the, if you like, or that, that history of the past. And let's face it, for a lot of these country, these areas, we're talking about the early 20th century, so it's not that long ago where some of these shrines and so on existed. There's very little um, information about them or there's very little commemoration. So this is where, if you like, current day practice around how we see ourselves in terms of religion and so on, in some ways, I would say is sort of following the indeed the colon the colonizer the colonial way of erasure. So everybody was taken out of their um, um, their um, obeisance and obeisance to um, past gods, and therefore all that is past. It's heathen, and we're now in a Christian era. So if you like, Christian era becomes year zero. So there's that tension again about how we deal with that. I mean, again, I think there are very good notable exceptions like indeed the transatlantic slave trade, as I've said already, there's a lot of documentation around that, but a lot of the other activities around and indeed, well, that both collude with the slave trade in the sense that in the case of Southeastern Nigeria that I know a lot about, the long juju of Aru Shuku and its relationship to the whole, the system and the trading network is something that has not really been, I would say, or, or at least the, the sites and areas related to that are things that remain not documented. Um, but let's talk about the, and then let's talk about the everyday. So we, that's the kind of the past the, and I guess uh, contemporary. If we talk about the everyday, or I would say in the 1950s, 60s onwards, um, we do have, again, as I've said in South Africa, documentation, which is great about particularly places like Soweto, where Mandela was before he was, he was tried and so on. But other parts of the world, again, this time I'm in Ghana to begin with, the Rex Cinema in Jamestown, where um, Nkrumah apparently had a lot of his gatherings before he became the first premier, uh, first independent premier in, in Africa. Uh, there's not very much um, information about that. Jamestown is basically... I wouldn't, well, I'd say a lower, lower class um, um, in a city, in a city area in Ghana, but if the rich have moved up the hill, literally, and Jamestown and its history is something that is still being struggled, is still struggling for identity. And I guess a more contentious one, Entebbe, Entebbe Airport, uh, what that, um, um, th that link to indeed the refugee crisis and so on. To the best of my knowledge, the, the original, this airport has gone, it's been rebuilt. And again, I don't think there's much of a memory or memorial as to what that's related to. I actually say to my students, your best bet is to actually watch The Last King of Scotland because there's a lot of background of the, the way in which um, Uganda at that point had a lot of modernist buildings. Um, but again, I guess it's, it's, it's um, relationship to, obviously the hideous Idi Amin regime has meant that a lot of that has disappeared. Um, but that idea about the history and the buildings, I would say that in architecture, it would seem as though the, the buildings are much more the backdrop than you sometimes have with other arts like textiles, music, and so on, which we'll come back to. And so again, the, the last picture to the left, lower left, is a street scene in Accra where there's very little um, history. It just seems like the everyday. And I guess there's that issue about, well, why do we record the everyday? And the reason is because some parts of the everyday, like in this case, Soweto, parts of indeed Jamestown, do actually have histories associated with them, but the history seems to overtake the building. Um, so where are we now? So indeed, just as we've been talking about, so where are we going next? Well, it would seem as though restitution is going to be the name of the game for the next decade. But I mean, we do need to challenge some of this. So in this case, we have what we assume will be a British Ghanaian architect who will now design uh, uh, a space, a museum for 
I presume the re return of the artifacts from uh, the British Museum and other places of the Bidin bronzes. So I um, mean, you've got this, I would say this tension, you know, how much of this is to do with, I guess, a continuing discussion about restitution, reappropriation and so on of identity, space and place. But it's, it's an interesting one, because how do we deal with this? Um, this is probably the first time for a long time we're going to be having that discussion. I'm old enough to know when uh, the Festival of Arts and Culture in 1977 happened in Nigeria. At that time, I was still in secondary school, and I can remember the papers in Nigeria all saying we wanted the bronzes back. They never came back. Um, so now uh, we hopefully have a building that we built for us and the bronzes will come back. So how do, how do we square that one and how does that building fit into the temporality of whatever the identity is of um, Benin today, Benin City, which remember has had a lot of history about it written right back to Dapper's time in the is it 15th century um, when, when um, the first visits of the Europeans to, to Africa. But interestingly, there are some, again, talking to Cape Town, um, you've got your Mocha building, which I think is a really interesting reinterpretation and re-adaptive reuse compared to the VNA, which really to me, the, so the Victoria and Albert waterfront buildings uh, now uh, was 1990s, which very much followed the, uh, I would say the typical redevelopment tradition that one finds all over the world in terms of, for example, in Liverpool, the Albert Dock. In this case, though, I mean, I think it's an interesting interpretation because what you have is the grain silo, which again, I guess is a modernist thing in itself. And now it houses the art, which presumably is modernist art from the world, but I'm assuming, because I've not been there, COVID, let's go, I hope we can move at some point. Uh, a lot of that art is from Africa. So I think that's an interesting interpretation of that. Um, so where does that take us again? Well, I think this is where I sort of go off piece and talk about what I'm really interested in, which I think is these linkages, which again, we've talked about today, and at least in part of the seminars I've popped into. I mean, again, we have to remember that Africa very much is the product of, or the African nations are the product of the Berlin Conference. In West Africa that I know a lot of, or a lot about, um, I mean, these are purely literally, presumably, whatever was cut up on that dining table or wherever. So back to Amez Dofe, the, the, the school I showed you um, in Ghana that was designed by Fry and Drew, they actually do teach in French and English because they're right at the border between um, Ghana and Togo. And obviously, linguistically, the, the ethnic tongue is the same, although the national tongue being French and and um, English is different. So this idea about the fluidity of culture and the ways in which culture travels becomes absolutely critical in the way in which we look at how I, I would say heritage, modernist or otherwise in Africa um, is going to evolve. So in this case, we have Pejulai Wo, who is an, a professor of art at the University of Lagos. And she deals a lot with textiles, but her textiles are batik. And batik again is something that has both come through Indonesia and also a lot of it is through the indeed the Kano um, dye pits and so on. So it's it's an international culture around textiles, and these textiles are traded across West Africa. I think both in terms of transport networks that predates the current Trans West Africa Highway that's in its thirtieth decade and so chuntling along slowly. Uh, coastal cultures, a lot of cultures have already been involved in. I guess, moving these um, textiles across West Africa and further afield. So the, the, the textile trade takes you to um, the Netherlands, it takes you to Germany, it takes you to Manchester. Um, so this idea about um, culture being fixed, I think, again, is something we have to challenge. But I guess what we want to look at is the specific identity of culture. And I would say in, in West Africa, the idea is much more regional, I would um, I'd raise my above, above the parapet to say than necessarily national. So um, in most parts of, um, of, of um, West Africa, again, there are people, persons who have lived elsewhere in the area. So in the case of Southeastern Nigeria, again, with the Biafran War, it's known that a lot of Eastern Nigerians went to the Cameroon. Half of the Cameroon actually speaks English. Um, others went towards the Ivory Coast. Um, so you've got this movement of people anyway, people and culture. And that I think informs what, you know, if you like, a, I guess it is a, a creolized culture it has become. So in, in the case of just finishing this 
um, image. Um, so what she's done is to look at the traditional way in which batik happens and is, is using modernist techniques. And the exhibition, I think, has gone to Los Angeles already and so on and so forth. So again, it's something that's in the international, um, in, in the international, in the international sphere. And I guess closer to home, let's go into Lagos. Um, we have Terra Culture. It's a very difficult building to photograph, but I think it's what I would call an interesting uh, mixture of um, a few, indeed fusion, back to what um, Turner was talking about. Uh, it's not a kind of typical rectilinear building, but it's basically a cafe hangout, or it was three years ago, who knows what's gonna happen post COVID. But what really struck me was that it was this space that had this, so it has a ramp going up, up so you don't deal with the stairs, which is great in terms of disability access, but it, it becomes part of this, it's almost like a spider's web, I guess. But interestingly, what it does is, it houses culture itself. So both in terms of its, um, uh, its artifacts, but importantly, new media. So apparently one of the media, um, media stars in Nollywood is the old proprietor. So you've got this top right corner, which shows you the latest um, Nollywood uh, movie, which again, the next time, I, the second time I went had next Netflix happening in whatever it was, some things of June. So it's really linked into current media, but also uh, you have the more traditional. So the bottom left, furthest to the left uh, image is of uh, book reading and Chimamanda Adichie had been there and so on. So you've got all the other parts of the arts being part of this fluid display, which I thought was really well captured in this building, which off itself, again, isn't that strong. But again, back to what I'd said earlier, maybe this is it, it becomes the backdrop to the ways in which we consume culture. Um, and obviously the, build, the the small square to the right is the detail. So you've got a, a raffia roof and the use of calabashes for um, light shades and so on. So I thought that was a really interesting example as to what contemporary culture might be. And maybe that's it, it's a container for other culture. But am I stuck again? Let's see. See if I can get it to right, okay. But I guess on a I guess more up, uplifting note, I think there are some interesting things on the horizon. So in this case, we're looking at um Dibia de Kere's work, which I think I've been following really since whatever it was, I think early 2000s. So from the bottom left, uh, school kindergarten school project, which won him the um, Aga Khan Award back in 2008 he's gone on to um, really expand his idea. So this is again where Africa, if you like, strikes back. I mean, he's an interesting and complex character. He's born in a small village in um, Burkina Faso, Gando, uh, but he's sent by his family to, to get an education and learn how to be an architect or build in, in Germany. So he builds his first building, which is the kindergarten bottom left which gets this award, but from there he's developed his ideas and his practice further. So at the moment, that's the proposal, I think, for the Benin Parliament, which is based on a palava tree. He's got um, an educational facility that he's building in, in, um, in Kenya. Uh, the bottom right is a cork installation pavilion for a festival in California, in America. And the, the middle is the Serpentine Pavilion, if some may remember, about five years ago in London. So, I mean, I think, again, to me, I can talk about authenticity. I think this, this shows diversity. But again, I think this issue about how the um, architecture itself transcends space and place, and it can be local, regional, and international. But it, it does begin to, uh, I think, morph into something that has both that local, regional, and international feel to it. Um, and so, you know, how would you define someone like Kerry? Uh, where would his buildings go? But I think, again, I guess you could say that of all great architects. But I think what's interesting is that I think there's this generation of architects from Africa and architecture in Africa that is able to cross these boundaries. And if, if we go back to the idea about textiles, music, literature, they already do that. So I think we're just late to the party. So I am coming to the end of my reflections. It will probably please you to know. Um, so I guess what are the ch challenges? I mean, I'm not going to go through the three projects. So I'm going to leave it, I think, as a kind of rhetorical thing for us to think about. But I think it's that identif identification of what we think um, 
heritage and culture is. So both the tangible and the intangible, because with all these buildings I've shown you, there's also that narrative, the orality, which should be part of the way in which we look at the, 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 um, the building. There's the issue about conservation, which again, we know we've talked about uh, in the, in, I think for, for Africa, we don't generally have the ability to just say, right, we'll make this thing a museum. It's got to have a, as they say, a business plan for it. And then I guess, again, what we've talked about before, how do we educate? How do we do the publicity? So I think rapidly moving to the end. So often, you know, you've got different modes in, in, in uh, I guess, in my anecdotal case, I do work a lot with um, architecture schools in West Africa at the moment. But then again, um, my colleague Ian Jackson, or he will be when I move to Liverpool, um, has worked strong, um, with local, um, I guess, local entrepreneurs. So to the left, um, the guy, um, he is a graphic designer and Ian put together an, uh, an exhibition which was Memories of Jamestown. So remember the picture I showed you about the Rex cinema and so on, just to get locals to realize what their history is. Um, I've done the same with the Dokomomo ideas around indeed the traditional Western culture, Western buildings. So on the doorstep of KNUST, a lot of the students, and we went right down to third year secondary school, we got them to look at the buildings and realize that they indeed had eminent historians, eminent architects in their midst. So actually the, the person to the um, forefront is uh, John Addo, who's now 93, uh, Laie, who's at the end, has now is now deceased, but it was great to have them at the conference and indeed give their memories of the KNUST campus, which seemed to have a lot of snakes, as I remember. But um, so that link between uh, sort of having fora where those who have this history and this memory to be able to discuss is great for students particularly. And this, of course, becomes international. So there's Lukash uh, working with uh, that was his project where, again, he worked with um, Ghanaian and um, Man Manchester students on um, looking at the future coastal development plan for, um, for Accra, which is partly done by the Eastern Europeans. And um, Irene is an architect um, stroke lecturer at the University of Ghana. And Ngozi is just finishing her, her PhD. Um, and so, you know, there are things, different things, writing workshops, projects, ways in which we collaborate, and again, oral histories. That's um, Nata Matiafo, who is a former mayor of Accra, who's also a planner in his own right. So the idea about having these collaborative projects really where, again, post-COVID with the release of Zoom, I think suddenly, well, not suddenly, but it does seem as though some of the issues we had before in terms of um, space and time, both in terms of cost of travel and so on, have become much more, I wouldn't say easy, but we, there are ways in which we can work around them. Um, so, and that would be it. There are various collaborations. I guess I should talk about the, well, the collaboration to the left, again, is a Dokomomo one where there's Ilse Wolf. Somebody can see her next to me. So uh, we had Dokomomo, what we were trying to create is Dokomomo Africa, which was going to meet every other year. So the year that there wasn't a Dokomomo conference, we would have a Dokomomo Africa conference. And that's Miles Glendinning, who I dragged on to talk to students in Ghana. Uh, and indeed the, the student behind him uh, is, of, is um, of Indian extraction and he did his PhD, not his PhD, his master's on library projects in Ghana. So he went off to Ghana to document the library. So again, this shows this transnational link. Um, but then also we are, I've been looking at trying to put together a West African network because again, I, I strongly think that these links across West Africa are such that to, to, to um, locate them only in one country means you lose the wider context in terms of how the fluidity of the discussion and well the fluidity of culture and indeed the ways in which we deal with both the buildings the 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 both the material and the intangible history um, linked to each other and I think I am pretty much at the end of my talk because um, I suspect the last one is a thank you so I think I'll leave it there and I think that gives time for discussion. So that's a writing workshop we had. I mean, interestingly, two, one student was from America, one went off to Basel and another is about to go to America as well. So this is working with um, MARC and other students from different disciplines uh, talking. Uh, we've had, we've run this for four or five years now. 
myself, Irene, who we, you, I introduced to as a, a, one of the pictures, and Kukua Manful, who's completing her PhD and is actually presenting tomorrow. Um, and the idea was that this issue about if you don't write your hair, if you don't write your history, others will write it for you. So in this case, what I have done is to work in parallel. We don't actually get involved in the architecture curriculum or any curriculum there. It's a, it's a, it's a, what do you call it? It's a summer project. It's out of academic time that these workshops take place. So I guess in some ways it's sort of taking away the heat of having to deal with curriculum battles and so on. But I'm happy to discuss that as well. But thank you very much for listen, for entertaining my thoughts. Thank you. All right. My Itabas at Atenda, this is simply Shona for thank you so much. Job well done. And uh, you have also raised um, so many important um, discussion uh, points. And um, let me try and muddy the water um, a little bit. I might misquote you. And uh, in that case, you need, to, you need to correct me. My purpose or my intention is just uh, to, to muddy the water so that when we do discussion, um, we have uh, a very strong uh, point for takeoff. So I like the idea of um, you know, connections, that map that you showed colonial infrastructure and, and, but it is also, or can an argument be made that it is also uh, following up on the uh, pre-colonial networks? Because the were people in West Africa, they were in contact with each other and, 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 and so on. And we don't uh, sometimes, um, uh, you know, emphasize that heritage. But also the interesting thing is that particularly the collaborations that you spoke about, they are quite uh, fascinating intergenerational uh, knowledge uh, transfer. But uh, what makes them also very interesting is uh, going into the issue of uh, say David Ajay and, 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 and who is Ghanaian and, and, and designing, you know, this thing in the palace in, 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 in Nigeria, <laughs> you know, if you use colonial labels, you know, we can talk of identity here <laughs> and, 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 and the like. And then of course, I've got so many um, Nigerian friends who are involved with that, uh, <laughs> with that project, but, 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 but let me leave it. Let me leave it there. If you want to comment, you can comment. Um, I couldn't possibly comment. But you're absolutely <laughs> right. I, I am actually contradicting myself. Um, although I hear David Ajay grew up in Tanzania, so just to add that to the just to add that to the mix. <laughs> no, 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 that's fine. That's fine. And also the issue of um, intangible heritage that that came out quite uh, quite strongly, and we do we do need that um, quite uh, quite a lot. Maybe it's because I'm now hungry or something like that. I would also have liked to see food <laughs> as part of because, because yes, in, 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 in that care building, you know, people are sitting, they are eating, they are relaxing. But uh, thank you so much. I uh, just see uh, showing how much I loved your um, your address, uh, colleagues. I'm now opening the floor for questions, comments, um, and any points that you want to uh, raise uh, for all. Who wants to, who wants to go, who wants to go, who wants to go, who wants to go? Guys, this was, this was quite, this was quite fascinating. Don't, don't, don't tell me that, you know. I think everybody's <laughs> you ready me, for dinner. You want me, you want me to go again? Okay, Shahid, <laughs> thanks. <laughs> no, no, I, I want to take off where, where Shadrach left off and, and talk about this, 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 this aspect of networks and and, and international and global reaches of mm. of uh, of of African innovators and their influence in all parts of the world. Uh, I mean, you mentioned Orishas in Nigeria, and of course in Brazil, mm. that's big and important, and it has an architectural and heritage 
um, historical value. And so, uh, you know, so, so those influences are not, not immaterial or dismissed or easily dismissed. And so, uh, so if somebody comes from Tanzania and works in, gets educated in Ghana and then <laughs> is a project in Nigeria, this is fine and okay. Uh, and it's, 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 it, it should be normal. Uh, why do we think of it as, as abnormal or, uh, you know, as, as, as something strange? We should, we should celebrate, well, not even celebrate it. We should just accept it and work with it. And I, I wonder whether you wanted to make further yeah, comments. On I that. think there's something about how you get into the skin. And this is an interesting one for you. I mean, I remember going to South Africa actually just before the elections. And I used to get my petrol from a certain station. And the person would always speak to me in Kosa. And I'd say, look, I'm not Kosa. And he said, no, but you're African. So in some levels, you're right. I mean, does it really matter? But I think there's something about how one engages with the culture. And that's my slight worry. I mean, even I feel removed from quite a lot of culture in Nigeria because I've lived in the UK now for more than a decade, in fact, more than two decades. But what you do find in the new world, so to speak, is places like indeed Brazil, Cuba, where the, in fact, they, they have actually developed that candomblé, um, abacua, whatever it is, they, there's a very specific way in which they engage with it. And you literally cannot fly in and engage. You have to actually get to be part of that. And I think in all fairness to um, the, the museum in Benin, you're absolutely right. It isn't just Sir D.A. There is a team of whom I hear there are a lot of Nigerians. In fact, I hear there are more Nigerians in the office than Ghanaians. Um, so, so there is an engagement with it. But we do have to look at the wider politics, which was the point I was making. Um, why now, if you see what I mean? And it's interesting that, so, so does this mean that, uh, you know, who claims, sir, whatever? Um, I would have been much, I think that the, when I compare him, and I, I shouldn't, I guess, with um, Kere, there does seem to be a bit more authenticity around what Kere seems to be doing. But true, that is purely, um, the, you know, this is, this is an off, off, off the cuff lecture. I haven't done the full analysis. Um, so, um, but I think there's something political about why the restitution is happening now, and indeed what the conditions are in which the restitution will take place. No, fabulous, fabulous, and uh, yeah, I do, I do understand where you are, where you are coming from, and um, yeah, but but nevertheless, uh, these are interesting uh, discussions that speaks to the complexity of what we call a modern heritage, and also as we confront these legacies of the of the Berlin Conference that uh, people in Senegal cannot, uh, you know, speak to people in Kenya. And people in Kenya cannot, you know, speak to people in South Africa. We need to have that spirit of Kwame Nkrumah and, 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 and others to say, how do we network more within, uh, within Africa than uh, outside, of, uh, outside of it? Edward Dennison. Ola, thank you so much for that. That was absolutely incredible and a lovely way to end. Um, I have a, just one question, quick question. And you mentioned it, or the word anyway, in the final sentence there, authenticity. Do we need it? Because you were talking earlier about contradicting yourself, which I think is a good thing, um, especially when it comes to the modern. And someone, as someone engaged in the UNESCO processes, we have to write a statement of authenticity for the sites that we're interested in. But, but is it really helpful or, or might it be something that as part of the modern, we try and do away with and what would we replace it with? There's a lot there maybe for you to answer, but if you could just maybe yeah, reflect could, on that, that one word, that'd be wonderful. Thank you. I mean, I, th I think, you know, if we go to the classical, when is authentic, authentic anyway? Um, I think definitely in the case of a lot of, of Africa, not just West Africa, the authentic is becoming very difficult to really, if you like, dig down to, particularly when we think about what is modern. So contextually, there are certainly things that I would say are of a certain area. Now, are they authentic to that area? I don't know, but at least there's enough context in which to situate them. But I think to sort of say that this is the authentic piece of whatever is a very difficult call, uh, just because we're dealing with various forms of, of history, that's one thing. But also, as I hope 
the talk has demonstrated, there is that constant flux and flow, um, both in terms of people's cultures, um, everything. So the idea, and, and remember these, the countries we're talking about, if we're talking about it within a situated country situation, they are just too young, I think, to be able to say, we've had all this history and held on to it for so long. It is a much more fluid process. And I would say that adds to its originality because it's so mixed as opposed to necessarily the authenticity. So you can talk about provenance, I suspect, but in terms of it being, this is the authentic, that's much more difficult. You architects surprise me because creativity, you know, innovation is what creates heritage. And then you are saying, no, 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 we must freeze things, keep them as they are. You know, anyway, a conversation for another day. Julia Gallagher. Hi. Hi, thank you very much, Ola. I really, really enjoyed that. Um, I want, I was particular, I mean, there's a lot to take up, but the thing that really sort of got me and struck me was your comment about why, why are buildings in the background compared to other forms of art. Uh, uh, and I just want to know if you've got a sort of more to say on that or an answer and whether that's the case to the same sort of degree everywhere. Um, I mean, in West Africa uh, itself, but even more broadly throughout the continent um, and whether it's shifting. You, you say you would like it to shift. I'm not sure if you were saying that it was shifting. I think it's, it's, it's a difficult one. I think that to me, that is one of the, yeah, it, it's it's very, it does seem to need, if you like, unpacking, because we do have the signature buildings, that's part of what you do. But in terms of, I mean, I don't know whether one goes down the anthropological route, which I've sometimes argued in terms of COVID. I mean, most Africans do not stay indoors. So in some ways, for once, you know, being out and not being in enclosed spaces actually helps in terms of health. But we do have those signature buildings, but they do seem to be much more secondary to, um, well, they are, they're the backdrop. Um, mm. The personalities are much bigger. I mean, I guess one could take the pragmatic view that the problem with a lot of buildings is that to keep them pristine, the maintenance is very difficult. So, I mean, we know that in terms of the Festival of Arts and Culture building in, in, um, in um, Lagos. Uh, but I, I just wonder whether, again, it's that thing about because, again, back to where they're being imported from, the idea about identifying with something that is originally or whatever one <laughs> authentically African is something that is secondary to the function they provide. So, you know, you go and watch something at the arts theatre, you're not going to the theatre, you're going to watch something. And I think probably, but I, I do think with Kere and others, and indeed Ajayi, maybe this will start to change. Because I mean, it does seem as though there is that that break, and people have talked about it again. That you know, you've got the vernacular right up to the great mosque of wherever. Well, Timbuktu. Um, I mean, even Yamasukro, um, it's there, but it's a lot of the more modern buildings have less of the cachet as had the um, original mud-built buildings. And obviously in the case of um, coastal West Africa, anyway, we, we build in Wattle and Daub, there's a three-year cycle. Mm -hmm. Every three years you build, you rebuild anyway. So the idea about the permanence of the building is something that is relatively new. So when you put all the, when you unpack all of that, the buildings become less important, but I think it's beginning to change. Good example in Ghana, the um, the um, alumni movement in terms of their secondary schools is really big and booming. The problem, of course, is that some of the wonderful modernist masterpiece buildings that we all like are being renovated because they 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 remember their alumni and where they went to school and they want to improve the building for the su the students to come. So there are some changes, but for the majority, I think the the, the building is secondary to other things. And of course, Eastern Nigeria, Ab Abribais, and a, a lot of the very rich traders will build their mansions, but they only go there for Christmas. <laughs> so, Thank um. you. Okay, uh, fantastic exchange. I can see that there is a comment about Sir in, um, in the chat, and that's from uh, Professor Alina Segobi. And um, that's, that's, that's he, one of his uh, signature projects is um, the designing of the Tabombeki uh, Memorial Presidential Library in, in, in Pretoria. 
And of course, that's, you know, when you have a superstar amongst us, you know, they all, they get all the jobs. What do we do? How about us? And, 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 and. anyway, uh, Mike Turner wants to turn up the volume before we conclude. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you. First of all, just to make a note about authenticity is that not necessarily original, but we authenticate the value. In okay. other words, we determine the value. So the authenticity is the, the process of authentication. Okay. And I think that this is probably a, a more critical part. But I think that uh, Ola, um, I think that it was brilliant because it actually was complemented the opening keynote of Olga. And I think that together now we have a, a really dramatic way forward. Because uh, at the beginning of the morning, she spoke about that the modernism is not from the present to the past, but it's from the present to the future. It is our asp aspirations. And you spoke about the invention of tradition. And the question, therefore, is, is really is that how do we then, um, then generate then this understanding of modern uh, uh, taking on board that, in fact, that there is some future um, ideas which should take place. This is the originality, this is the creativity, and this is the room by which we can then uh, come about and bring this part. So where do you see this invention of tradition? Is this something which we should poo-poo or says, no, this is exactly what we should be doing? <laughs> so really, you put me on the spot. I, th I think there, there is, there's room for it. There is room for exploring and looking at what what we want our future to be. So, and some of that will be creating traditions. So, I mean, back to what I've just said. So there are, you know, schools where they're only whatever, they're only a century old in, in the UK, in, um, in a lot of Africa, but there's that, there's now that tradition about people going back to venerate their school and so on. So, so there are, there are some positives about creating a tradition and, and it's good that you've actually, thanks for calling up the, what authenticity is. I think authenticating what is there will be very important. I think I did take a quick look at the NARA um, declaration, which I hadn't done. And I think it is that start for a lot of Africa that, you know, we we, we do have in, in many ways, much more latitude than I guess, historic um, cultures that are much more constrained by indeed the history. So we have that leeway, but I think it's important to authenticate, but, and also to be able to, I guess, create what works in terms of how we see the difference in um, different parts of, I would say, different regions of um, the continent. And indeed, their links with the, the wider diaspora. Um, last year was the 75th anniversary of the fifth, the holding of the Pan-African Congress in Manchester. So I had to go back to my books. And I mean, reading Du Bois and so on, there is that discussion about the greater diaspora, which is also part of this discussion. I mean, we're obviously talking about what is on the African continent per se, but that wider relationship, again, is something that we, we are free to develop and indeed invent where, where, where needs be, uh, the traditions that will help us hold, de develop, and indeed think about a future of that. I think that idea about the future is very important, certainly. And how do we define the future? You know, generations, generations, generations overlap. You know, my grandparents are still there. Their grand, their grandkids are still there. Generations overlap. And how do we know what the future wants? Anyway, I am just my usual self, mudding the water. Do we have any? Do we have any questions? Any comments? <laughs> you, you, you can come back. You can come back again and 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 and, and raise this yes, Shaib. Uh, all right, I'm going to do exactly what what you said uh, and and say muddy the water further because this question around demonstrating the authenticity is 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 highly problematic. I mean, it's not straightforward and simple. Uh, you go. It, we always talk about how communities must participate in these processes, and you go to any community and as many community members they are, there as many authentic stories. Uh, I mean, I, how, uh, I think yeah. there, are some, there, there are narratives that communities will know about, and um, 
you know, it's whether one can dig them back. I mean, the, again, it's some of them are problematic. I mean, going back to, again, anecdotally, I mean, I found out that in my village there was a night market. Why is there a night market? Kept asking. In the end, it was clear that it was part of the slave route to the long juju of Arashuku. But you couldn't. And the older, the elders, and this is back to the University of Nigeria and the term paper, I had to go to the village and talk to these elders. And then I had to put two and two together. So that, that knowledge is there. And that knowledge is normally grounded in truth, because I then read, uh, what's his name, G.I. Jones's thing about the oil rivers of eastern Nigeria, and it actually corroborated. But you need to be able to ask those questions, because oftentimes the, the material is there. Well, if you're lucky, I think obviously this, this elder has now died. I mean, but um, th there's a lot of information that we need to be able to, yeah, document, record, uh, that will actually indeed verify or at least authenticate some of this and it's being able to do that but also using that back to um, um to shadrach's thing handing it on to the next generation and i would say that's what proverbs do to be honest talking about intangible culture you know uh in west africa as a man and it is very gendered it would seem you are not seen as a man until you can do this <laughs> um the proverb things so and the proverbs are in themselves i guess unwritten codes of you know, handing on the, the traditions such as they are uh, in code or in whatever to the next generation. And indeed, you know, so Shona philosophy, for example, those proverbs, they have information about climate change, about continuity. Basically, uh, that was the school. <laughs> that's where that's where the, 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 the source of uh, the source of wisdom and uh, do we have any other do we have any other questions any other any other comments but maybe since it's four minutes to a half past uh, at this point let me thank you so much once again Ola for this uh, uh, intellectually stimulating uh, conversation and a keynote um, address uh, let me hand over to uh, Shahid uh, for the uh, last remarks to close of uh, the day. Uh, from me, thank you. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure having these uh, conversations and uh, learning from all of you. Um, see you later. <laughs>